This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and around the world on the Starcom Radio Network. Worldwide, toll-free, 800-610-7035. My email address is exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And our main website, where you can listen to the Exxon, 724-365, www.exxon.com xzoneradiotv.com Exonation, my guest this hour is Colonel Patrick Murray. We're going to be talking about Will America's Birthday Present Present Be a Terror Attack? What I'd like you to do to Exxon Nation is just Take a listen to this. Several law enforcement officials told CNN on Friday that authorities are warning of possible terrorist threats around the July 4th holiday. The Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and the National Counterterrorism Center issued a joint intelligence bulletin to law enforcement across the U.S. The bulletin doesn't warn of any known active plots, but it serves as a general warning of heightened threats. It says extremists could launch attacks tied to independent state or in reaction to perceived defamation of the Prophet Muhammad. CNN reported in recent weeks that U.S. law enforcement officials believe the Islamist terrorist threat is the highest in years. The officials have raised concern about possible domestic attacks tied to the July 4th holiday and the upcoming visit of Pope Francis. Exxon Nation, my guest this hour is uh, Colonel Patrick Murray. He's retired. He was a U.S. Army colonel. His military career took him out of his native Oklahoma to exotic destinations throughout the world, operating in diverse cultures and missions. He commanded tank units astride the Fulda Gap, staring down Soviet forces just across the border. Soon after, he found himself on the other side of that border, living and working in Moscow for the Defense Intelligence Agency. Colonel Murray worked in uh, numerous U.S. embassies, including as a military attache in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, during the Balkans conflict. He was part of a military political exchange program assigned alongside American diplomats at the State Department in Washington, D.C. Later, he became the U.S. representative to the Military Staff Committee at the United Nations in New York. During the Iraq War surge of 2007, he deployed to Baghdad, Patrick holds uh, degrees from Oklahoma State University and The Ohio State University, is a graduate of the Command and General Staff College and the Defense Language Institute, where he studied Russian. He has also been a guest lecturer at the Army War College. He often says that there is no statute of limitations on the oath he took to, and this is a quote, support and defend the Constitution. So after the Army, he sought to continue serving the nation in a different venue, He ran for U.S. Congress in Virginia, where he was twice the Republican nominee. Uh, He lives and works in 
Old Town Alexandria, where he enjoys jogging and biking along with along the Potomac River, and volunteers for his pet causes, including the Board of Directors for Virginia's Veterans Affairs and the local Animal Welfare League. His website, www.gopatrickmurray.com. And Colonel, it's a pleasure having you on the show, sir. Well, Rob, it's so great to be on. Thank you for having me on tonight. Colonel, um, the news is is packed today with, um, you know, 4th of July terror warning issued by FBI, Homeland Security. Uh, you've got a new transatlantic campaign as pledged to challenge extremist groups like ISIS. Um, it, it seems that something is awry. The, um, the Homeland Security, the, the law enforcement agencies, the intelligence agencies feel that something is going to happen this July 4th weekend. Is, is, are they just being, how should I say this, are they, are they just being precautionary, or do you, sir, with all your experience within the military, think that something is up? I think it goes beyond precautionary, Rob, and I'll tell you why. Uh, ISIS is a threat um, unlike al-Qaeda mm-hmm. and, and unlike like 9-11, it's morphed a great deal, especially with regard to social networking. I mean, these guys are Spengali's when it comes to social networking. Consider this. They are sending out 100,000 tweets per day. Wow. ISIS is. They are great at recruiting fighters, and they're also good at it. And I think this is what most of the uh, intelligence community is concerned about, they're great at motivating the so-called lone wolf attacks. We saw that last weekend on the beaches of Tunisia, right. as well as in the Shia mosque in Kuwait City. And, uh, and so those are, those are concerns that we have. We have the confluence of our national holiday, the 4th of July, Independence Day, with the fact that it's also Ramadan right now. And that's the time that Islamic extreme, extremists historically ramp up their attacks. And so I think all those things that come together... Is, is where where we are right now? How come it how come it seems the war against ISIS is, is on a downslide as far as we the good guys are concerned? How come they're gaining speed and momentum and we're not able to stifle them? Well, um, without getting too political, our commander in chief just mm-hmm. came out a couple of weeks ago and said, you know, we don't really have a strategy to fight ISIS, and uh, and we're waiting on the military to come up with that, which kind of rubbed us the wrong way because really, I mean, that's what we do. We've offered courses of action Mm -hmm. strategies. Now I'm a retired guy, but I have a lot of friends on active duty and plus that's what they do. And so guess who does have a strategy? ISIS. And they're implementing it with, uh, with great success. They're winning. They're taking terrain. They're taking cities. They're recruiting people from all over the world. The United Nations had a report out earlier this year that they estimated over 20,000 people have gone to uh, become ISIS fighters from over a hundred different countries to include our own. And so they're, uh, they have a message and they have a method and they're implementing their strategy. What is the attraction to people to want to go and fight for ISIS? This boggles my imagination. You know, I've given that a lot of thought and I think that's uh, if there's a $64,000 question in terms mm-hmm. of dealing with this over the long term, I mean, it's one thing to, to fight a tactical battle, which we're not really doing, but we should be. Uh, but then it's another thing altogether, Rob, to look at dealing with this ideology that seems to be gaining strength. And, and F, I've thought about it for a while. You know, everybody, when I joined the Army a long time ago, I wanted to be a part of something bigger than myself. I mm-hmm. wanted to, to feel like I was doing something worthwhile. I think we have a lot of disaffected young men and women, uh, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, to include many here in this country, and they hear this clarion call, twisted and poisonous as it is, and somehow they're attracted to it, and, um, and they either decide to go over there and specifically become ISIS fighters, or uh, they try to facilitate things here in the States, and that goes back to our original point about uh, potential for attacks this weekend. How come we just can't find a way to to block ISIS from number one coming onto this side of the of the waters and when it, using the internet, blocking their IP addresses, 
and and starting the fight here at home. Why, you know, like, uh, is, is part of the problem the immigration policy within the United States that, you know, send us over who you want, we'll take them? Well, that's a huge debate in my country right mm-hmm. now on, on immigration, as you know. And uh, But I agree completely. We should be doing a lot more to uh, both counter and to block uh, what ISIS is able to do uh, on the, in social media. Right. And there are some organizations that's gaining some momentum now. And uh, there are private organizations who are urging the federal government to do that. I'm sure the federal government's involved somewhat. But, I mean, look at all the hacking issues we have. Our federal government mm-hmm. is so big, it's such a behemoth, that it's hard for it to keep up, either technologically or otherwise. And so Office of Personnel Management's getting hacked. The IRS is getting hacked. And, and they're dealing with all that. They're under siege, not necessarily from ISIS on this, but probably from the Chinese and maybe some people in Russia. Sure. But when you look at it holistically like that, I think that – that speaks volumes to why we can't get ahead of this issue uh, with ISIS, at least on social media. You've got a new book out, and I was wondering if you could tell us about your new book. I would love to. It's called Government is the Problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, You mentioned I ran for Congress, and it was sort of my, uh, what I like to call my look behind the curtain. And uh, I'm I'm a constitutional conservative, and I want, I believe that um, the, the beauty of our country comes out of limited government and individual liberty. And that comes from our Constitution. But, but we sort of flipped that on its head now, Rob, and our government is unlimited. And uh, it's, we have a huge 18 plus trillion dollars of debt. We're on the same debt profile, by the way, that Greece is. We're just oh a gosh. little bit behind them, and our economy is a little bit bigger and easier to, to sort of facilitate. But nevertheless, that's where we're headed. We have over a hundred trillion dollars in what's called unfunded mandates. And that's basically just career politicians promising, uh, you know, money, whether it's in our entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare, or pensions or anything else. There's not enough money in the world to pay for that. So something's got to be done. And that's why I wrote this book uh, to, I believe our country needs an intervention to sort of get back to our core values of limited government and individual liberty. Where did this all go wrong in your opinion, sir? Well, I spent a lot of time in the book talking about that. I really think it started in the early 20th century. Uh, We had the rise of what we call uh, a progressive movement, which sort of um, said, you know what, it's it's okay for government to grow. We need to have a bigger government. Government mm-hmm. can make good decisions. And uh, we passed the 16th Amendment to our Constitution, which was a federal income tax, kind of turned the government into the world's biggest ATN machine. And then our politicians, who used to be uh, what we would call citizen legislators, they started to see the the money and the power and the growth and the authority of government. And then uh, being in Congress kind of became an end unto itself. And you can see the the increase in our spending, our government, our authority, and in the tenures of these politicians in Congress elongate starting uh, in the early 20th century. And, and over time, as we've grown government, uh, this is, we're, we're, you know, the chickens, prefer, you know, the, the old saying, the chickens are kind of coming home to roost yeah. now. And it's time that we we made some changes. Um, let, let me ask you this: This is coming out of a uh, left field, but there's a, there's a lot in the news today about Donald Trump and his comments, and and him throwing in his hat to be a, a presidential candidate. What's he going to do? Is he going? Is this a public? Uh, is this a publicity stunt he's pulling, or, or or do you think that he could actually make a good difference? Well, I, I don't think he's going to get the nomination, and I don't, you know, he, he, is, he is a confrontational, tell-it-like-it-is guy. And our politicians, both parties, Republicans and Democrats, have become so politically correct that mm-hmm. they just, they, they, they have a team of uh, analysts and everybody that tells them what they can say and what they can't say. They poll test everything, and then it just comes out kind of vanilla. Well, Donald Trump isn't like that at all. 
and he says what he believes and says what he thinks, he's also very successful as a businessman. So while I don't think, Rob, that he'll ultimately get the nomination, mm -hmm. what he is, is going to do is he's really going to modify the debate among all of these, you know, what are there now, 14? Yes, uh, that's right, Republican, 14. Yeah. Uh, presidential candidates, yes. The fresh air, and I think he's going to, uh, I think he's going to, open up the debate I, yeah, you, you, there's something that I read online uh, this was uh, on Amazon and it says our founding fathers created a unique system of limited government and individual liberty against a backdrop of free markets that ignited the greatest explosion of wealth prosperity and opportunity in history however the American dream is now on life support Government has become a massive parasite, leeching us from our liberty and productivity and putting us on the path to civil unrest. Wow, that's kind Gee, of heavy. I wonder heavy. who wrote that. Jeez, I wonder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's on the back of my book, and, uh, and that's, that's the grabber, uh, and, and I believe that. Um, I wrote that, and, you know, when you think about where our federal government is, it, mm -hmm. it totally depends upon the productivity of the American uh, taxpayer and worker in order to sustain and expand itself. And we have our politicians in Washington, D.C. constantly telling us we're not paying our fair share. There's no way to cut anything in the budget. We mm -hmm. have to just have more, they call it revenue, which is just code for raising taxes more and more and more. And so it, it's an unsustainable path, Rob. And and the government, uh, you know, that's that's where the parasitic component comes in because it's leeching us of our productivity, our wealth, and because we're such a, <clears throat> of a regulatory state now, also of our of our liberties. Um, many people believe that the government is allowing certain things to happen within the United States in order to f to take more control and more away from the private citizen the uh, the net, you know putting a muzzle on the NSA and, and other other intelligence agencies from doing what i believe they should be doing and my my philosophy colonel is if you have nothing to hide you have nothing to fear and yet everybody is so worried about their information their privacy when it comes to agencies like the NSA keeping a closer eye on the citizens do you think the NSA and other government agencies should be put on uh, on leashes, or should they, in the in the name of democracy and freedom, be allowed to continue gathering data without going through the courts, without going through search warrants? Well, it's it's a real fine line here, and we have a, a Fourth Amendment which uh, to the Constitution which allows for uh, privacy, and so here's my deal: I, I want. Uh, of the United States to be safe. I don't have a problem in principle mm -hmm. uh, with the NSA collecting what they call metadata. Right. It's an amazing concept. Uh, but at the same time, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't trust my government. I don't trust the politicians. We've had this huge scandal with the IRS recently. And when you start to look at uh, when members of Congress use federal agencies, whether it's the NSC or the IRS or anything else, to target their perceived political opponents, it starts to become problematic. And so the, uh, the NSA is a component of that, only to the extent that, um, for my concern, it's, it's just I, I don't want the government storing that thing, mm -hmm. all that data. And that's what they've sort of worked out recently, is the NSA will collect it, but we're going to we're going to have it be held in the private uh, in the private sector. And, yeah, they should have to get a warrant uh, to, to if they want to listen specifically to like this call you and I are on right now. Right. Um, they should get a warrant to say this is we, we need to listen to this for whatever reason. OK, then go listen to it. But just to do it uh, wantonly. Uh, that that I disagree with. Yeah, and yet, and yet, Colonel, there are people out there, citizens, who have the technology to intercept and listen to cell calls. You know, so where where do we draw the line between the citizen being able to do this without a warrant? 
without any any uh, probable cause, and the government, who, in my opinion, has the probable cause when it comes to terrorism. Yeah, no, it's, so there's a there is a difference yeah. there. And so to just to sort of flip that on its head, okay. uh, a citizen doing that rightly or wrongly, and um, it, it does not have the power of government behind him or her. Uh, and and of government agencies, mm-hmm. of, uh, like you you hear somebody talking about uh, maybe they're talking about a certain politician from a certain political party, and you don't like that, and that's an adversarial relationship. And so, let's just get the IRS to go uh, do some audits on them. Right, that's what's happening. Okay, so and, what? So what? So we're that's where I really have concerns with the government. So what we're seeing is the Nixon days again. Well, in very different situations. I mean, we yeah. had Nixon erased all that tape, that uh, 18 and a half minutes of tape. Uh, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, she erased, what, 30, 40, 50,000 yeah. emails that it turns out she had on a private server in her basement in her house in Chappaqua. Mm-hmm. But she's Secretary of State, Rob. Yeah. You don't think that, that uh, server got hacked? I mean, they can hack into any uh, federal government server with all the protections, mm-hmm. and and I have a lot of concerns about that. So how do we, how do we turn things around, sir? Well, I believe so. It's almost as if the founders, when they were writing our Constitution, had a window into 21st century America, and um, and it's sort of. And, and I like to say it scared them straight. And so they included this codicil in Article 5 of our Constitution. And the Article 5 describes how we can propo- uh, propose and ratify amendments to the Constitution. And so um, this codicil, that when it was put in actually by a Virginian named uh, Colonel Mason, George Mason, allows us to propose constitutional amendments separate and distinct from the federal government or from Congress through a a process called a convention of states. And that's what I argue for in my book, uh, a convention of states and two specific constitutional amendments to limit government. One is congressional term limits, and the second one is a balanced budget amendment. Because, you know, because we know Congress will never self-limit, and so we need to limit them from the outside. As a me- as a former member of the military, should there be boots on the ground when it comes to fighting ISIS? Well, not anything like we had before. No, here's what I here's I think the my quick solution to deal with ISIS. Um, so we have these things now that uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is calling lily pads, where we have non combatants out, and I think it's a mistake. I think we're going to pay a price for that. But I would, what I would do is embed uh, some special operations forces with the Iraqi security forces mm-hmm. in a combatant role, but more importantly, in a forward air controller role. You know, we're, we're flying, Rob, we're flying 10 or 12 sorties a day uh, against ISIS, and over half of those come back without dropping their ordnance because they don't have any uh, good uh, targeting data. And so we should ramp up our sorties. Ten or twelve a day is nothing. I mean, ISIS is out holding parades in broad daylight when they took Ramadi. You think they care about ten or twelve sorties a day? They don't. So we should be doing five, six, seven hundred sorties a day with forward air controllers. That that would get ISIS's attention, and we should also directly arm and train the Kurdish forces, the Peshmerga, that's our boots on the ground. They're good fighters. They are determined. They, they confront ISIS all the time, but they don't have the weaponry that, that we could be providing them to make them a much more lethal and efficient force. That's so, what I would do to deal with ISIS. So why aren't we giving them the weapons that they need to, to fight ISIS and to bring this war of terrorism to an end if, if that's possible? Well, it's yeah, it'll take more than that. We talked about our, our earlier in the show, but I think it would help stem ISIS's continued march uh, over in um, Iraq and Syria and northern Africa and uh, even into Egypt. I mean, they're they're 
they're talking about Hamas, and I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. I just read this today. Hamas is a terrorist organization in and of itself in the Gaza Strip exists to get rid of Israel. That's their that's their whole reason that they're there. Um, ISIS is basically calling them a bunch of wusses and says, we're, we're going to come and we're going to take you guys out. I mean, they are feeling their oats. We're not doing anything, in my opinion, or not nearly enough, in my opinion, because I think we have, frankly, a commander-in-chief who just wants all this to go away, who really isn't comfortable being commander in chief mm -hmm. and would just rather ride this out till January 2017 and let the next uh, man or woman deal with it. Is President uh, Putin just watching this and noting the, the weaknesses in the commander in chief and is that why Russia now is starting to to bring the bear back to life? Well, very much so. I mean, Putin is an old Cold Warrior. Mm -hmm. He's a KGB, retired KGB colonel. He wants to get the band back together. Yeah. And he's made no bones about that. And uh, they have a big military expansion program going on right now. Of course, you know, they've indexed the Crimea from Ukraine. They're right. actively fighting in eastern Ukraine. That's made our eastern European allies, NATO allies, very nervous. Mm -hmm. And I think Putin sees his window of opportunity excuse me, between now and January 17, and he is he's a chess player, and he's going to make as many moves as he can while he's pushing on an open door. I guess that's the difference of having a commander-in-chief who is a warrior compared to a commander-in-chief who is a politician. Well, that's right, and I think when you make, uh, the other way to say that is when you're making military decisions based mm -hmm. upon political calculus, uh, it's not going to work out well for the soldiers who are on the ground and for uh, any kind of military objective you may have. What would happen, in your opinion, sir, if ISIS was to join forces with, if all the terrorist groups were to join forces and side with a, com a country that's not friendly to the United States? Well, you've seen a lot of uh, coalescing among uh, different terrorist organizations. I believe Boko Haram over in Nigeria has pledged uh, loyalty to ISIS, mm -hmm. as has uh, a couple of al-Qaeda, um, I think al-Qaeda in the Maghreb and uh, elsewhere. Because, like I said, I mean, they're, ISIS is now threatening Hamas. I yeah. mean, these guys, they respond to strength. That's, what, that's how it is for them. And when we were in Iraq, we were the strength. When we were in Afghanistan, we were the strength. They responded to us. But now they're, we're gone. And so who's the strength? I mean, it's, it's join us or get your head cut off. So, you know, how's that going to work out for you? So that's, I think, where they're going. But they're not um, – I mean, Iran, or, uh, Iran is all, mm -hmm. obviously fighting them. They're a, a Shia Persian uh, country that's fighting against ISIS in Iraq. Russia is fighting against, well, certainly Sunni Islamic extremists has been for 20 or 30 years in Chechnya. And, uh, uh, so it's, they're, um, you know, they're just a scourge to just about any civilized organization. And they're, like I said earlier, I mean, they're growing, they're great with social networking their numbers are increasing. They have billions of dollars that they've taken from banks and they're, you know, they've got oil wells. I mean, these guys are formidable. Colonel, please stand by. You and I have to take a brief commercial break at the bottom of the hour. Exo Nation, Colonel Patrick Murray is our special guest. Um, the question we started asking at the top of the hour, will America's birthday present be a terror attack? For more information on the Colonel, or www dot gopatrickmurray.com that's www.gopatrickmurray.com and we'll both be back on the other side of this commercial break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada.
each new extreme weather event or terrorist act, it becomes increasingly obvious that we live in uncertain and challenging times. We all buy car insurance. Why not collapse and catastrophe insurance? Matthew Stein, an MIT-trained engineer and green builder, has written two outstanding books to help people prepare, plan for, and deal with everything from minor situations lasting a few days to full-on collapse. Matt's first book, When Technology Fails, is a manual for self-reliance, sustainable living, and surviving the long emergency. This massive book covers the gamut from first aid and emergency preparedness to alternative healing, renewable energy, primitive living skills, and 18th century technologies that could be critical to your comfort and survival in a long-lasting crisis. Matt's second book, When Disaster Strikes, is a comprehensive emergency preparedness handbook and survival guide. When Disaster Strikes is an essential item for every family's go bag. Both books are available at all usual sources. There's a wealth of totally free information posted at whentechfails.com and author signed copies may be purchased at mattstein.com. That's www.whentechfails.com and www.mattstein.com. One Florida drug dealer made a serious mistake when he dared peddle his poisons on the schoolyard of Robert W. Morgan's preteen daughter. Morgan, a budding film director, tracked him to his hidden Everglades lair where his meth lab mysteriously blew sky high. When Morgan's demands to police to make grammar school playgrounds safer from drugs were ignored, he sought the counsel of CIA operative Frank Sturgis. Again, he was warned to give up what was becoming an obsession. Instead, Robert used his reputation as a filmmaker to infiltrate the mafia by stroking their egos and offering to make films for them offshore so they could import them as foreign product without paying taxes. When they agreed to build him a studio in Panama, Robert called the DEA and FBI and offered to work undercover. In time, their combined efforts revealed how the mob was secretly laundering billions of dollars through the Vatican Bank in Rome before returning to the States as foreign investments. Now read Morgan's story, Citizen Spy, Vatican Cover-Up, The Mob, Money Laundering and Murder, available at Amazon dot com bn dot com and borders dot com back in victorian england a famous theologian posed a perplexing riddle why are the two top personalities in the bible tagged with the numbers seven and eleven Academics agree the answer is found in the stunning discovery of a hitherto secret Bible structure explained in a new book called The Genesis Grid. The discovery is so simple that preschool children could illustrate it. Certain claims are hugely controversial and may offend some, but at the Exxon, we've studied this awesome new book and agree with one expert, and I quote, These discoveries appear to be beyond coincidence. So who or what hid this wonderful pattern in the Bible, and what might they do next? Find out more, Exxon Nation, and read reviews on www.genesisgrid.co.uk. That's www.genesisgrid.co.uk. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. Hi, this is Eric Rawls of Cosmoverse.com, and you're listening to Rob McConnell in the Exum. Hi, this is Blade Runner, and you are listening to Canada's number one paranormal radio show, The X-Zone, with Rob McConnell. 
Hi, I'm Laura Sabrin of Cease to Fields Organic Vineyards in Jordan, and you're listening to Canada's number one paranormal radio show, The X Zone, with Rob McConnell. Hi, my name is Lady Ashley, the White Witch of Niagara on the Lake, and you're listening to Canada's number one paranormal talk radio show, The X Zone, with Rob McConnell. Welcome to The X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. My name is Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and around the world on the Starcom Radio Network. If you'd like to listen to what radio was meant to be, join my friend Ed Till Monday through Friday from eight. I'm sorry, from nine a.m. until five p.m. Eastern, right here on the Starcom Radio Network. Colonel Patrick Murray is our special guest. He is the author of Government is the Problem. Now, his book is available at his website, gopatrickmurray.com. And um, he, here's something else that, that uh, was quoted from the back of the Colonel's book. Colonel Murray's book is a call to action at grassroots level and operations orders on how to change the conditions of the political battlefield, take back our country, and restore the American dream for future generations. First of all, Colonel, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure talking to you, sir. But when was it that it was changed? Now, as as a Canadian, I've always thought it to be we the people, but apparently it's I the person now. When did this happen? Well, I think it's more uh, the, about the, the federal government, and ah. uh, it still is we the people. But I think what's happened mm-hmm. is that our government has gotten so big, and for whatever reason, a lot of people in America today, Rob, aren't paying as much attention to what the federal government's doing as they than they used to. Right. And I think our career politicians actually depend upon that and rely upon that because it enables them to... Uh, you know, they, they take the same oath I took to support and defend the Constitution, but really what they're supporting and defending are their incumbencies, and um, it, they gain great wealth, they gain, get, gain great power and authority, and it comes at our expense. It's a zero-sum game uh, for whether it's I, the individual, or we, the people, but I just say the biggest divide in America, you know, we have all these issues right now with, with racial divides, Income divides, you know, Occupy Wall Street, the 99 percenters or the one percenters, and then geographical divides or divides between uh, Democrats and Republicans. I think it all flows out, Rob, of the biggest divide, which Mm -hmm. is our federal government versus Main Street America. And that's what we seek to change. You know, up here in Canada, sir, racial discrimination is, is non-existent. And when we watch the news from down south, you know, our good neighbors to the south, below the 49th parallel, I have a hard time understanding why there is this ever-growing racial divide. Uh, Isn't it time to to forget the past? My goodness, I don't know any country that hasn't had a past that in one way or another has tarnished one group or one faction of that society. You know, it's just like this this problem with the flag of, you know, that that you people were having in the south, the um what's it called, the um rebel flag. It's the Confederate battle the confe- flag. The right. Confederate battle flag. It, it, you know, it's it seems that there has to be an issue if it's not gun control, it's the racial divide. If it's not the racial divide, it's the the flag and how do, how do you fix all these problems? You were running for Congress. How would you, as a congressman, address these issues? Well, first, let me just say this, Rob, and I hear what you're saying, and a lot of this comes out on our, on our mainstream media. I think it's way overblown, ah. and, and I think it's, uh, as I said just a second ago, mm-hmm. I think that that's what our career politicians want is – uh, distractions. I mean, we had all, we've just been talking about all this stuff with ISIS. Mm-hmm. I talked about our $18 trillion debt, everything else that's going on, uh, 
with regard to metrics in our country that are pointing downward. And all our media focuses on is this Confederate battle flag in the light of that horrific uh, attack in that yeah. church in South Carolina. And, you know, Obama's old, President Obama's old chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, had a famous saying, and it was never let a crisis go to waste. That's true. And I think a lot of that speaks to what you're seeing and mm -hmm. what your listeners are seeing uh, in our media. But it's a distraction, and it's a, we used to call it in the Army, it's a dog and pony show. That's not really the, the relevant issues. You know, there's an old saying in the media these days, if it don't bleed, it don't lead. Exactly. And yeah. uh, that's right. If it doesn't bleed or if it bleeds, it leads, however you want to say right. it. And that's very true. And uh, but this whole thing, listen, no one supports uh, slavery. There, nope. There's always going to be some individual racism in people's heads here and some people's heads. That's never going to go away. There's mm -hmm. racist, racist thoughts and beliefs all over the world. Sure. There are still uh, slave camps in Africa. I mean, it's just, it's there. You can't do away with it. But no one wants to bring, um, you know, racism or uh, slavery back or anything else. All I would say is, with regard to that flag, and I don't have a dog in this fight, but it's almost, you know, that's part of our culture. And, and it should never be flown on any official government, uh, you know, building or anything else. That's wrong. And I think South Carolina made the right decision about uh, doing away with the Confederate battle, Confederate battle flag. But it, it belongs in places like museums. I mean, this is our past. That's right. And we need to be honest about our past. And we need to deal with it and say, this is where we were 150 years ago. And now we have an African-American sitting in the White House. So we've come a long way. And there's still more way, uh, you know, a ways to go. But um, I, I, I think that's the case. You know, I think about um, the Taliban and ISIS, and uh, th they tear down uh, these ancient religious mm -hmm. symbols and statues. And, and it's almost, and, and I'm not comparing anybody to the Taliban, but, but, but we have people over here that just want to get rid of all that. That's not going to make it go away. We need to be honest about it. It's as if no matter how hard the country tries to to heal the wounds, there are those out there who like to keep tag, tagging it so that wound never closes. You're exactly right, Rob. Yeah. And there are, um, I call them race hustlers. Uh, one of them's name is Al Sharpton. Oh, yeah. There are others. And uh, it's, like, it's like an attorney. So mm -hmm. if there's no... If, if everybody got along, there was never a car accident, there was never a medical malpractice, there was never a divorce, you wouldn't need attorneys, right? Right. And so the, the, more, the more problems there are, uh, the more business there are for attorneys. The more perceived racism there is, the more money Al Sharpton makes. And so if anybody is keeping racism alive and in the front, forefront of American media and and uh and everything else it's people like al sharpton because that's how they make a living and yet he apparently he is he has the ear of the president yeah go figure and and i can't even begin to tell yeah. you what that's all about he's in the white house all the time yeah. he also owes uh five or six million dollars in federal income taxes Whoa. and nobody can figure that out i mean it's just like Okay, he just he skates, he gets away with it. And and so if you want to talk about double standards, there's a big fat double standard uh right in everybody's face right here and a lot of people aren't happy about it. Colonel, I just uh, received a message on uh, Skype from Scott McKenzie who is listening to us in Anchorage, Alaska right now. And he would like to get your opinion wow. on the uh on the Patriot Act. Yeah, well, Scott, um, welcome in from Anchorage, Alaska. I've been there when I was a little kid. Beautiful place. Uh, I think that uh, we just had the renewal of a component of the Patriot Act, which is something that Rob and I were talking about earlier. And uh, it had to do with the NSC 
and the ability of the federal government or the, the legality of the federal government to hold on to all of our uh, all of the metadata and the compromise that Congress came up with, which I happen to agree with, was that the, all that data will be held not by the federal government, but in the private sector. And uh, when one of our agencies feels there's a concern or a need to specifically uh, listen into a certain call or, or whatever it is, an email, they mm -hmm. get a warrant and they execute that warrant and then they get to listen to it. So, look, I want to be safe as much as everybody else and I want Americans to be safe. But but we have a Fourth Amendment, and um, and we also have individual liberty here, and so we have to kind of walk that line, and it's a fine line to walk, and we're going to be dealing with this for a long time. An email from Sheila, who is listening to us in Miami, and she would like your comments on the reopening or the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Cuba. Oh, Sheila, that's... That was hot news today, and I got to tell you what. Uh, to be frank with you, I seldom uh, agree with with much that uh, President Obama does, but I think he's on the right track with this. And let me tell you why. Uh, I, I would rather have Cuba uh, under our umbrella, working with them, than with China or Russia or anything else. Here's where I have a problem. Um, Obama has a track record of being a terrible negotiator. If you know anything about uh, when we traded um, five Taliban general-level officers for a guy who's actually now being charged with desertion named Bo Bergdahl, then that might give you an idea of how he negotiates. And, and we're, we've got a, an agreement going on. We're trying to negotiate with Iran right now about nuclear weapons, and we're walking back all of our so-called red lines on that. So. He's not a very good negotiator. I would have held out for some more concessions from Cuba, uh, not the least of which is some things with regard to human rights and uh, things like that, and also holding on to Guantanamo for a while uh, before I did this. But in principle, I think it's a good idea. All right, one last question for you, Colonel and gang. We have to let the Colonel get back to work over here. Uh, this is from uh, Mark in Napa, California, via Skype. Colonel, can you give us your feelings, and what do you think will happen on the, with the Iranian nuclear talks? Well, Mark, uh, I might have to come out to Napa and share a little wine with you uh, to talk about that, but I'll tell you this. Uh, the deadline was yesterday, and we're extending it. I think that I used to negotiate agreements, uh, uh, bilateral agreements with uh, the Department of Defense and the State Department, and I did multilateral agreements when I was up at the United Nations. And there's one thing uh, I believe right now, and if I put myself on the side of the Iranians, you know, you always want to try to think about what your adversary is looking at. I would look at that and see that um, if I were them, I would realize or believe that the Americans want an agreement much more than than they do, than the Iranians do. And the uh, Ayatollah has laid out his red lines recently. Uh, he said there's no way that you guys are going to come and inspect our military bases. just not going to happen. And uh, no irregular inspections will happen by the IEA, IAEA, IAEA. And that just means, you know, you can't do surprise or announced inspections. Those are critical to verification and compliance. And that was our red line earlier, but now the administration's walking it back and saying, well, you know, maybe if we just could look at some of your military bases. Oh, no. And, and it's kind of, it'll kind of be a negotiation. So we're walking this stuff back. I'm very concerned, and, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, this track record of making bad deals, I hope it doesn't carry through to here. And, uh, and I hope the Senate will exercise its constitutional authority to advice and consent when, if and when a deal is cut. This almost reminds me of the, the line, red lines in the sand that uh, President Obama drew several times when dealing with Syria. Tripped right over those red lines, yeah. didn't we? And, sure uh, did. Yeah, if uh, chemical weapons happen, that's right. And so, listen, our, our 
adversaries uh, see that. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned earlier in the show about uh, I think Putin is, sees his window of opportunity to make as many aggressive moves as he can while Obama is still president. I think the Iranians uh, think the same way. And uh, because all the, all the Iranians care about are lifting these economic sanctions, and that's the other issue. It's like you don't give your kids dessert before they have dinner. True. And that's what the yeah. Iranians want. They, want. they want those economic sanctions lifted immediately. And I worry that we're going to back off of that. And if we do that, they don't care. They're, they're going to continue doing what they're going to do, and, uh, which is continue to um, enrich, enrich uranium. And we're not going to we're not going to be able to do anything about it. And this is all about Obama. It's two words: Obama legacy. That's what he cares about. And so that's my concern with this. All right. I said no more questions, but I've got one from a good friend of mine who's listening in Tampa, Florida, and this is from Corey. And the question is to you, Colonel: Do you think WikiLeaks will help or hurt the eventual fight against ISIS? Corey, that uh, I think that's going to be determined. I mean, I have I have some serious problems with Snowden, and mm -hmm. uh, so I'm a, you know I'm a military guy, held a pretty high security clearance, and and what he did was wrong. But you'd be naive to think that the revelations that have come out of this have not been uh, fundamental in transforming what mm -hmm. America uh, American citizens how they view their government. And so with regard to ISIS, I mean, I, I just, I don't, it's hard for me to say because I don't have any, I mean, I don't have any access to, to what that stuff that's still hidden is. Um, I mean, it could be helpful. I hope it, you know, I just don't know. It's, I, it's, an, it's a known, as Donald Rumsfeld used to say, it's a known unknown. It's a known unknown. Uh, Colonel, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight, sir. It's been a great pleasure. I hope we have the opportunity of speaking to you again in the future. But before you go, tell us a little bit about your company, Third Wave Communications. Oh, it's just a little boutique uh, communications company that I have, and it's largely around my publishing. And uh, I've written that the book, Government is the Problem, mm -hmm. and I'm writing a couple of other books now. And, uh, and so that's kind of my my way to, to contribute and to continue to support and defend my constitution and, and have a little fun. You know, Colonel, uh, when you before we went on air, I, I thanked you. As I always thank any member of the military who comes on this show, thank you once again, sir, for being there, for helping to protect freedom and democracy. And God bless you all. Been great being on your show. Take care, Colonel. Exonation Colonel Patrick Murray has been our guest this hour. www.gopatrickmurray.com, and he is the author of "Government Is the Problem." I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break at the top of the hour as we continue here in the Exon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and around the world on the Starcom Radio Network. Don't go away. today most people want what is called the American dream. They want love, a family, a fancy car, and a nice home in a nice neighborhood. They also want a good job and money to travel to interesting places. Life is great because they have the American dream. But what happens to this dream if they hear they have a devastating illness like lung cancer? The doctor may tell them they need treatment immediately or they will be dead in six months. He tells them, you need surgery, and then you need chemotherapy to get better. When they get home, they think of many unanswered questions. They ask themselves, will I survive when so many of my friends with cancer have died? How will I deal with the pain, hair loss, nausea, and vomiting, sore mouth, and other side effects of chemotherapy and pain of surgery? Will I be able to keep on working? What will happen to my family? 
Then they look at the internet and wonder, is there a better way to deal with lung cancer and return to my American dream? Carl Helvey can tell you, yes, there is a better way. Carl Helvey is a registered nurse with a doctorate in public health and a 38-year lung cancer survivor. Carl was given six months to live when diagnosed, and he refused chemotherapy and surgery. Carl used alternative interventions. Those not only helped him overcome lung cancer, but also to remain cancer-free and healthy for over the past 36 years since recovery. In his book, You Can Beat Cancer Using Alternative Integrative Interventions, Dr. Helvey will tell you his story of using all natural treatments for lung cancer and continuing to work during his treatment. Free of pain and discomfort, Carl will also share how he remained cancer and disease-free since then without chronic illnesses or prescribed medications. His story is supplemented with chapters by Dr. Bernie Siegel, Dr. Francesco Contreras, and Dr. James Forsyth, alternative integrative physicians, and Dr. Kim Dalzell and Tanya Harder-Pierce, health professionals, all have successfully helped others overcome cancer. Research presented by the alternative physicians on their treatments for lung cancer demonstrate a significantly higher long-term survival rate for lung cancer clients than those obtained by conventional doctors. In addition, their clients were free of or had reduced side effects. You can beat lung cancer using alternative integrative interventions by Dr. Carl Helby is now available at all major book outlets and at www.beatlungcancer.net. That's www.beatlungcancer.net. This information may help you return to the American dream.